I thought that because this is, revolves around the, the, the golden egg in a sense, that their friendship every Friday, you know that they have lunch uh, pretty much every Friday and they have for a long, long time. I'm curious for starters, if we were a fly on the wall at the golden egg, I'd like to know what the biggest sort of thematic debates, artistic ones, that you guys have. Is there something that you kind of keeps coming back to the debate Arthur believes this. Chris is a different kind of a guy. He's a, he's a different approach to things. Are there any major themes that you battle over artistically? <laughs> and the fact is that if we are there just the four of us, sometimes we do talk about art. I think we have some certain things in common about. Um, I think looking at us, we look like four old white guys. But I think we're all very liberal. I think we all believe in total freedom of artists. I think we believe in all forms of expression. But if you watch Arthur Payne, which I have done now for years and years and years in this country and other countries, he, the way he goes about it is with the precision of surgery. And it's the same thing I noticed because I've eaten at his house five million times. You go early to watch him prepare. He goes to cut a simple radish or something and you think he would be, you know, it's surgery. And you watch his hands, and that precision, the precision of concentration, you know. And I, it's hard for me to believe he's Italian. I really don't think he's Italian. <laughs> because we draw from the figure together every week on Fridays. We've been doing this for years. Grant does it. Chris does it sometimes. And I walk in. i got to put on opera on, you know. I'm talking to the model while we're working. And he, say, he won't say a word for three hours. And he's completely constant. And I think if that's, that's if that's art's approach, that precision sort yeah. of surgical discipline. approach. Discipline. Yeah. 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 So who's the loosest among you as an artist? Do you think? <laughs> <laughs> Before we go to I mean, the <laughs> wait, 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 he drops the F bomb. <laughs> I would say one comment about Arthur's work. I, after 30 years, or 25, well, not long, I've known you. I feel there's this deep spirituality in his work. I know that he's a Catholic, that he's, uh, um, you know, deep believes in that, and that he's lived a life of, um, of that. Yeah. Don't, I can't really, you know, speak for you, but I feel that the content of the work is spiritual. I don't want to say it's Catholic, because it's, but it's filled with the essence of the best aspects of Christianity, if I might say that. That's quite a statement. Around food, too. I Remember feel like yeah. there's the grace of food and company, and um, the imagery is filled with fish and women and a kind of... Uh, convocation of spirit. I mean, it's and I don't go to church. I mean, I pay, I give money to my neighborhood church, and I gloat on the fact and brag to the guy that runs it that I don't go. <laughs> so I'm that proud that I don't go to church. So I, I mean, I find my spirituality in him, you know, in a way. And the Catholic connection, Jay. Remember, in Christianity, the Last Supper is the second most important icon next to the crucifix. You know, and that celebration of reliving, of reinvesting a lot. And that is a major theme in his art going way, way it's, back. It's like going to Italy. It's you don't have to back. believe, but you kind of swim amongst the people who do. And you... Uh, oh, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> that's really what I do. I have, I, have to, I have to put my hands in him on art because I've worked with him for a lot of time. We did part together when we did the Great Bay Show ten years ago. And um, what I found really interesting about art is how he got from being, his, his approach to painting was somewhat primitive, how quickly he get, began to get an incredible ability to work with a tiny little palette, and he mixed all his colors in the painting. Now, I don't know many artists that can do that, can actually take a bunch of mud, colored mud, and screw around with it and get it on the painting and make it look right. I mean, it really is a, an incredible skill thing, and I agree with what's been said about his spirit, the spirituality of his work. I think that's really there. I mean, his floral paintings, for example, his paintings of Iris, are, they're really spiritual paintings. But I, I think his ability to paint the way he does is really quite remarkable. Let me tell you what I think is so remarkable about, about you. And one of the things that I, I just I feel so fortunate to be around you and, and by association, all of you guys, is the 
the reinvention that you guys have in your own minds all the time. You're starting something new, you're creating something new. You know, it's a it's a very youthful when I said you were boys, that reminds me of that. Chris, to you in particular, how in the world, eighty years old, how do you start a new project and how do you leave you know, find the muse again? Again and again and again. First of all, I've always painted the series, and my series really become repeatable. Uh, for example, these square cut and half paintings are a series that was started in 1957. And I did a group, and I didn't do any more in that series for 10 years. And then I did some more. Some of these series are, are repeated over and over again. They're picked up, but some of the series are just one shots. I mean, the painting in the hall out here, the dust painting uh, with the water and the fading light, is a series that consists of only maybe less than 10 paintings. That, that, I start and went on to other things. And I think one of the things that is helpful for me is that I work on a series of things until I feel I get kind of tired of that series. And then I go on to something else. Do you know that you've begun a series at, at the start? Or are you, are you into a couple and then you realize? Well, it, can be, it can be just chance of uh, seeing something. Uh, that those night paintings, those dust paintings, were definitely observationally based. Some of the paintings, like these paintings, the big squares here, I feel you can you can sense in your students that desire for fame. Your artists. I don't think anybody's an artist or an actor or a creative person who doesn't fantasize about fame <laughs> because fame is power. It's what our society has told us that is a way it's a ticket to power and and survival. I want to paint, that's all I want to do. How do I provide for myself? And I think that's the way most of us end up in teaching, is because that's one of the, that has been traditionally one of the main choices, that if you want a, somewhat of a stable life. I woke up one day and said, I want to do what I want to do. But I was in graduate school and I said, hey, I'm going to go to New York and make it. Let's go. And I wrapped everything up and headed to New York. And I lasted about three, four months. I put my tail between my legs. And I went back home, you know, because it was tough. Uh, I mean, just the very, uh, I was doing welded sculpture to, to countermand the fire department of New York City to weld in a building. You had to pay everybody off, which meant you had to have literally a lot of cash just to be able to do your thing. You know? So it, I, think I think young artists worry about surviving. And I think they do fantasize about fame. But the issue is, how do they, how do they survive? Art de Mambro is working and has been working for quite a while now with a younger uh, artist. What's, what's that? Who's back here? Yeah. Uh, what, what do you draw from that? You're working from, with a, a younger artist, and as you work together, what, what's the positive strength for you from that? Well, that pretty much came to fruition when we did the, the circus project. We did a series of large paintings of circus life and so forth. And uh, I talked to Chris about that, and he said, it'll never work out. Two artists can't work together. <laughs> well, actually, we did it, and uh, it did it pretty well. Of course, one thing was we had big paintings, eight feet long, you know, and four feet high, and then Alan would say, go ahead, you go down that end, I'll finish. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, he'd erase some of my stuff off. He didn't do any miniatures. No miniatures. No miniatures. <laughs> Big brushes, big strokes, you know, right. round tones or whatever you want to call it. And uh, I've learned a lot. So, what'd you learn from him? Uh, <laughs> Not so, so many things. Get so one good one. Um, just to trust yourself a little bit. When, like, art, art's a very intuitive painter, and and the way he, he'll just he just paints from his gut, and to trust yourself. You know, he's always after me. You gotta have a plan, he says. Well, I don't have a plan. I, I, you know, I put the thing on the wall, and then I, like one of the artists said, I don't know whether it was Kooning or somebody else, but I asked him, how do you start a painting? He says, you just, you know, do something, do something else to it. And that's the way you do it. Uh, uh, put, he, put, go ahead. Go ahead. Put on that. Uh, there was a guy at, when I was in grad school, a painter actually hangs in the Museum of Modern Art, uh, but not internationally known. He would actually uh, put a, he had a big, uh, like a, a stand table in the middle of the studio. And he'd lay the canvas down and he'd turn the lights off. He'd turn the lights off and he'd just start putting paint and rubbing it and doing it. Then he'd turn the lights on and he'd react to what was there. He said he just could not put that first 
dab on the, you know, hanging on the knees of two spotlights, and there is, oh my God, here's, here's infinity. Uh, what am I going to do? It's like a blank page for a right. Exactly. He would turn the lights off and literally just start rubbing paint on, and then turn them on and react to it. And then the way he did. The thing about art, though, is that he is not schooled in the traditional way. I mean, his wife used to say, perspective. What is it? Art doesn't know anything about perspective. <laughs> and we were sort of, like, that is the beauty of it. Like yes. he he does. I mean, the worst thing he could do is go to a drawing class. I mean, I really think he'd wreck God, it. God, if he got a graduate degree, it's, it's like Gogol. He chased out the devils with the angels. You know, we're all <laughs> so he's great the way he is. And I have friends who are painters, and they look at his work and they don't know him. They say, God, I wish I could do that. Like you can't. If you know too much, it's over. If you were going to write your uh, a, a, basically a, a tagline or a summary phrase or paragraph about what your work is. Do you have one? What, what words would you use? You don't have to say anything specific. But what kind of ideas would you include? Well, I think, I think fundamentally, I think that to me the great value of art is it stimulates the imagination. And, I, and the stimulation of the imagination is a survival tool for the species. So I hope that I can raise issues that are somewhat enigmatic but get at the idea that survival of our species is dependent upon the cultivation of the imagination. Arthur Boulderaki, how about you? If you had to encapsulate your, you know, your work and describe it to someone who had not seen it yet, what would you say you were trying to accomplish? I'm trying to replicate visually the middle quartets of Beethoven. <laughs> That's what I'm trying to do. I, uh, I don't care much about it. just shoot high. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I just, uh, I, I, I'm, not a, I'm not a journalist. I don't care about reflecting about the time I live in. I'm trying to talk about being a human being and, and taking this, this very ancient art form, which to me is a, is a very wonderful form of meditation. I mean, who was there's a guy, Jeremy, some of you, a book written 30 years ago, a guy came out with a book called The, uh, the Zen of Drawing, I don't remember that. I think he likened it to, to, to meditating, to, you know, to really reflecting on your own life in that particular way. I, I look at it as a very personal art form. Uh, it's a beautiful description. And that's what it means to me. I mean, I don't, I don't have a big statement. I don't want to make a big statement. I'm, I'm, my ears are hurting from big statements. <laughs> And I'm just really looking, and I think that um, that's what I'm that's what I'm most interested in. Arthur Ambro, how about you? Well, it, it, it's a mixed uh, bag. I <clears throat> for 31 years I was a surgeon, which is precision. You do exactly what you follow in the books, you know. And because other surgeons before you have devised these operations that work, and you know change anything. So it's, it's a discipline that, you know, you really have to abide by. And there's not much freedom, say, of expression. You just can't be operating on something and say, well, I think I'll just try. <laughs> 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 no. Turn the lights off, Art. <laughs> Nothing about art, even up until about 1958-59, uh, when I started painting, and uh, I, there was a young woman in the uh, operating room that I was friendly with, and she had a boyfriend who was a graduate of the Philadelphia School. Well, and right after that, I got married, and my wife came down, and the four of us hung around together, and he took me to the first show up at the uh, Metropolitan of Winslow Holman. I said, wow, all of a sudden my eyes were opened up. And that's, that's the thing about art. You know, you can explore, you can create, you can do all these things. It just opens up a whole new world to me, and I'd like to show it to other people. So that's pretty much the way I feel about, you know. Yeah, we'll let you finish this, this, this particular <laughs> round of that, of that question. So if the, going back to it is, you know, you're writing basically your paragraph that's going into the into oh, what my catalog. What? This, is what I, this is what my work is about. Well, I think uh, ever since I was little, I was a, an artist. I don't mean to say that like I was a serious artist, but I was a good artist, like some people are good at other things. I wasn't an athlete, and I spent a lot of time alone. And I think that if you're an artist, you have to be 
comfortable by yourself for long, long periods of time, and you want, you don't, uh, I mean, I tell my students that they should be prepared for that, that there's long periods where you're alone, and I like being alone, and so that's a pleasure for me to go into a room, and I found when I was about 12 or 13, I did a painting, and I could spend two or three days on it down in the basement, away from everybody, and I was perfectly content. Mm -hmm. And I think I go back to that, that solitude. What, what my work is about or what it, what it means, I, I can't really tell you. If you were to design uh, a curriculum for uh, grade school kids or junior high school kids about art, what, what, what comes to mind for you? What would you like to see us doing in terms of teaching kids about what you all have learned? Anybody? <laughs> well, I can tell you that for spending 30 years teaching kids to draw it was one of the most interesting experiences in visual co communication that I ever had because kids didn't know how to draw. Kids in high school didn't know how to draw. They did, they, I can't draw. The common thing was, I can't draw. Why can't you draw? Well, I don't know why I can't draw, but I can't draw. And my belief is that you can teach virtually any child to draw. You may not make them into Michelangelo, but you can teach them to draw. We don't teach our writers to be great novels. We teach them to write so they can communicate through writing. We teach people to draw so they can begin to see what's going on in the world visually. We'll get their visual genes hopping up and down. Grant or Arthur? Well, I, th I think the same thing. I think that we don't uh, put it to kids early enough. They're given scissors and paper and so make something pretty. Or Tone depressors. Yeah, it's very, <laughs> really, it's supposed to do all the other stuff. Like, it's supposed to be the place where people go to be creative, the art department. You know, there's not, it's, it becomes a psychological mess, really. It should be a place of discipline and vision where people are looking, learning to see. So you give them options, and Chris is right. To be able to express yourself visually is one of the great options of being a human being. Apparently, <laughs> it's interesting. When a little kid, kid uh, nowadays, like a little kid makes drawing, everyone says, oh, that makes beautiful drawing. <laughs> they get to the fourth grade level, and they don't want to do those kids' things anymore that the parents love. They want to be able to look at something and make something that looks like that. We don't do that because we want to encourage their, in quotes, creativity. Fact is, we should teach these kids to be able to use their visual skills through well, drawing and other kinds of things. We want them to make things, let them be makers, but let them also have the skills they need at certain ages to deal with reality. There was a period there in the 60s or 70s when all the schools were developing courses that combine skills, English and art, math and something else. I mean, it's very interesting that that died out. It died out because of the stress of, stress of people wanting to go to college and having to pass testing. Testing, as we use it in this country, is destructive. It doesn't encourage making, it doesn't encourage problem solving, it doesn't encourage creative responses to things that need dealing with. It just I, I think that our tra traditional media will endure because of pleasure people get from using <coughs> these media. They have skill at certain things, they enjoy doing these things, they enjoy making physical objects. I was involved for about 10 years in the, in the whole era of, of uh, conceptual art. Conceptual art confused a lot of people, but basically conceptual art came about because of the emptiness of the Greenbergian years and minimalism. That's my view. Artists wanted to do something, not just make a form that by itself was supposed to be the perfect form. It was a revolt against hyper-formalism in the art. <coughs> and my thought is that artists will continue to do all the things they do. That's uh, not going to go away, but the one thing that's so interesting to me about artists every, uh, throughout history is they do change their modalities. They do take up <coughs> doing it. It's still art, but it's done in many different ways. And that, you know, when you think of classical music, I mean, I love classical music, but classical music has used the same tools for a long time. It is Thank God. Hmm? Thank God. <laughs> yeah, okay. But the fact is that when artists pick up these new tools, they're always challenged by the conservative people who want to maintain the traditions. And that, that's an issue that I think is too bad because I think that the creativity that goes into the work is not really what 
tools are used, but how the tools increase our understanding of all kinds of things. I mean, I think art is about intelligence. Art is not just about beauty. And beauty's fine. I'm not against beauty, believe me. But I think that the idea of using the art forms to, get, to generate new solutions to old problems, to be, as I said earlier, the business of cultivating the imagination, what I see, I see in cultivating the imagination, is a life-saving thing. You know, if we don't, if we lose our abilities, we imagine that we're doomed. I just heard a TED talk um, about creativity, and this, I can't remember his name, but he, he talked about meeting a little, knowing the story of a girl in, in an elementary school child drawing a picture. And the teacher came up to the little girl and said, well, what are you drawing? And she said, oh, I'm drawing a picture of God. And the teacher said, well, no one knows what God looks like. And she said, oh, they will in a minute. <laughs> <laughs> that's but I mean, that's why we're here. Exactly. And, and, and I, I'd like saying. to, before we end this, thank Mary for doing this. Yeah. You know, you don't find this kind of thing going on in commercial galleries. You do find it in universities, maybe. But in commercial galleries, as we've said before, it's more about what the sales are. And I think this is really a compliment to this woman, what she's doing here.